Well, uh, Jessa, thank you so much for um, helping me in my project. I was wondering if you could maybe introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about you. Sure, yeah, I'm uh, Jessa Gamble and I'm a, a writer, uh, mostly a science writer and I do some ghost writing as well. Um, and I was sort of put up to this by a friend of mine who's gonna be on later in the week. So I don't really know what I'm getting myself in for. I haven't watched the previous episodes. Um, so we'll see how this goes. Yeah, well, I guess I should give you a little background then. Um, basically, I started this project as kind of like an anti-social distancing project. I work from home and have been working from home for the past two years. And I was like, you know, I'm really interested in space. Um, we're going to the moon in 2024. I uh, want to be good to find out what people think about it and kind of um, create this collection of 1,840 interviews that we could look at, you know, in the future and see what were people thinking right before we returned to the moon. And uh, it sounds really valuable. I mean, um, because I would give anything to have this about the last moon landings. Yeah, indeed. I mean, of course, back then, you know, having video and interviewing people wasn't quite as easy as it is today, is it? That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, originally I was going up to people at coffee shops and, you know, at the mall and on the buses and what have you. But with this COVID-19 thing, uh, I had to reintroduce social distancing into my anti-social distancing project, which is kind of funny. <laughs> right. Well, you wouldn't have reached me anyway, because I'm in Canada, so. Um, um, I've actually, uh, I haven't been to Canada, but I have been to some unlikely places. I went to uh, London, York, and Edinburgh and interviewed people along the way. So I Very nice. Okay. Taking the train the whole way, was it? Uh, exactly. Well, on the way back, they were doing some um, uh, work on the, uh, the train. So they had like a bus alternate. So that's kind of neat. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, oh, lovely area of the world, especially when you get up north there. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Maybe in the summertime, especially. Not the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you mentioned you write science. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, well, I, um, I really don't specialize within that, um, but I have, I've, I've written a couple books now. Uh, one of them is about circadian rhythms and culture. And so I really had to grapple in that one with the fact that we, you know, our body are situated on a rotating planet, whether we feel that intuitively or not. And it runs our physiology. So I always found that sort of hidden force really fascinating. And then the book that I've just finished is about awe, the emotion of awe. So of course, with the overview effect and everything, it ties into space as well. So I have actually had a bit of a running, sort of a subcurrent around space. My brother's in the space industry as well, so I sort of, but you know, it has an area of specialty for me, but I, I definitely am interested in talking about that, uh, and I'm excited for that with you. Uh, so around the circadian rhythm, uh, did you go into kind of like the effect on people and animals that are you know, above the Arctic Circle, where they have six months of winter and six months of uh, night? Yeah, so um, I, I was actually, when I was writing the book, I was living in Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. So that's in the subarctic, but certainly the traditional societies around there um, had a very seasonal way of living because of that. So, you know, they they would sort of spend the winter kind of inside, like especially the Inuit, they would spend the winter inside and join their family. And then the summers were, were sort of like almost manic, uh, hunting, fishing, working, building, you know, um, very different hours were kept one to the other. And it was because that, that makes sense locally. And, and now of course we've imported our year round nine to five into that area. So government jobs, you know, you, you, go to work from nine to five and it's almost impossible in the winter. It just feels like the wrong thing to be doing because it doesn't fit the location. Uh, and are there like noticeable like psychological and social effects as a result of not having uh, a normal kind of day night cycle? Uh, so 
there's a lot of talk about um, seasonal affective disorder, you know, the sort of depression in the winter and the little known counterpart, which is, um, which is the summer mania that can, you know, if you are bipolar anyway, that can trigger um, a, a sort of a manic kind of time. Um, I'm not so sure that in the modern world with artificial lighting, it's quite as much of an impact. If you, if you live in England, let's say, you're probably going to work in the dark and coming home in the dark anyway. Uh, so I, it's not all that different. Yeah. Um, I lived in New Hampshire for one year. Um, I live in Texas every other year besides that, including this one. <laughs> but uh, that one year I lived in New Hampshire, I couldn't help but notice that whenever spring came, there was a bit of mania, even without, uh, you know, uh, the end of total darkness, you know. Yeah, yeah, there's always that one day where everyone smiles at each other on the street and you both know why, you know, it's just because it's the first warm day. Oh, exactly. People yeah. getting outside and sunbathing and they're just exactly. like, oh my gosh. Uh, and the book on all, um, our ability to experience all, uh, did you find that there were people that were particularly susceptible to experiencing all and other people who yes. were completely immune to it? Yes, that's exactly what we find. So it's highly correlated with um, the, the trait of openness to experience, which is one of the big five character traits. So you've got, so for the big five, you've got extroversion versus introversion. You've got conscientiousness. You've got, um, oh, what's it called? Neuroticism. Um, and, and then you have openness to experience. Um, and it is a whole suite of, of characteristics in a person. And, um, and, and one of them is that you really uh, are open to experiencing awe. You, so we, we talk about awe as basically, the operational definition is that it's um, a perception of vastness that's paired with a need to understand. So you really have to be somebody who likes to understand things, who likes to be challenged intellectually, who likes um, novelty, um, and uh, and it it has all kinds of effects beyond that. Yeah. Um, how much of all is tied into like emotion? Like, um, is it possible to be stoic and experience all? That's a great question. I mean, awe is an emotion. It's an emotion that has various flavors. Now, stoicism is that, so I'm trying to remember the kind of the philosophy behind that is that you sort of, you kind of don't let things phase you. Is it, is, it's almost like a form of, um, uh, what do you call it when you're like mindfulness, right? where you, you observe that things are happening, but you don't actually, it's like a non-reactivity thing. Is that right? Do I have stoicism right? That's the way I understand it. It's like, um, you know, it's like that pilot where the plane is like falling apart and they're talking to air traffic control. It appears that the plane is falling <laughs> apart. <laughs> I was supposed to, ah! <laughs> I am soon to die. Um, so I like I haven't seen any science on that, but I would imagine that the more removed you are from emotional reactivity, the the less connected you would be with that awe. Which is strange because mindfulness is so, so tied to meditation and things that are you know philosophies that otherwise I would think would embrace awe. So it's, that would be an interesting kind of paradox to pursue and really get into. Yeah, because I think it's relevant to historical space travel as well, because we select our astronauts based upon being able to stay calm under pressure, to um, regardless of what goes wrong, to be focused on solving that problem and, and what have you. And at the same token, we're putting them in the most amazing environment, but maybe we're sending people that are immune to really truly having a motive reaction to that environment. Oh, that's a great point because sometimes, you know, you wonder, I mean, some astronauts clearly have been deeply affected and others may actually feel that they are required to say that they were deeply affected. <laughs> 
affected. Um, and you look at the video, like um, that film that they did about Apollo 11, I guess, right? That was the first moon landing. Mm -hmm. um, so when they were landing and everything was kind of like the fuel was getting low and you see their heart rate is like 90 something beats per minute. It's like, how is that possible? Yeah, indeed. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, also, um, you know, we talk about going to space in order to kind of explore and to discover new things. And there's curiosity that's involved in that. And, you know, if, if you're so focused on like achieving your mission objectives that you don't have like the freedom or the inclination to be curious about what's around and maybe go off script and explore things, then, uh, you know, maybe we're not getting the best value out of our, our efforts there too. Yeah, I certainly, I mean, this morning I was sort of thinking about, okay, well, what do I think about us going back to the moon and so on? And it, I think, what I what I landed on was what you're saying is that we we sort of we should really pay attention to developing the reasons that it's sort of in parallel with doing it we should really develop a, a robust structure for explaining it to ourselves <laughs> do you see what I mean absolutely yeah and I think that perhaps was what fell down the first time like we should we should figure out exactly why we had this false dawn and it's as if we never went to the moon for all practical purposes. So we need to make, like, why is it different this time? Why are we more driven this time? Why do we have an innate reason to be there as opposed to sort of competition? Um, and what worries me, so we've just watched the SpaceX mission uh going up and succeeding and you know with the launch was quite nerve-wracking especially since you know spacex didn't always have the most meticulous quality control in the in the path in the distant past let's say and so you know i'm thinking oh you know like it's it was stressful to watch but then it was really exhilarating to see that they succeeded but then i see like the White House, a certain White House official being interviewed about it. And he says, this is the beginning of Space Force. And I shut down my computer because that kills it for me completely. Right? Because I, for, to me, the, the most inspiring use of space is peaceful. And so I, I'm a little worried that this time around, the reasons will be there and there'll be something I don't like. It's like uh, that phrase for all mankind, right? Or right. for all humankind is, is really what we should update it to. But I mean, essentially, I mean, that was the spirit at which we, we landed. You know, it was like uh, yeah, what one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, you know, that type of. Exactly. Sense. Yeah. And you know what the kind of like the irony of it is? is that the first time that we went, it was truly an American enterprise, like soups and nuts. Right. But this time they are uh, literally making an international enterprise. So it's yeah. like, and it's like in the actual doing of it, it was purely nationalistic, but the words were all, you know, kind of like brother and sisterhood and, and everything. This time we're actually, the mechanics of it are international, but the words are all wrong. Right. Yeah. I was thinking back to, so there was one event in space history that really continues to inspire me with its audacity, which is the Mir Corp um, having, having leased the Mir in its final days and just, and, and just, you know, private American citizens just deciding to go up and fly the Jolly Roger flag and be privateers and, you know, hire the first commercial uh, cosmonauts. That to me uh, is a part of the space future that I'd like to stay alive. Like you don't actually need to spend billions in order to inspire people to feel empowered. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see that sort of the smaller side of it continue. Yeah, absolutely. And it was 
I, I shame to think that, I mean, that was almost like the Apollo uh, thing as well. I mean, that was like the, the late, late part of the 1990s. Yes. Uh, almost uh, had a private space station with private, well, you know, I mean, Russia would have been transporting the astronauts and stuff. But um, uh, what's your understanding about what happened to that? I mean, why didn't it continue? So most of most of my understanding of that, I mean, I've talked to Rick Tumlinson a, a, a little bit about it, but most of my understanding comes from uh, the documentary called Orphans of Apollo. So I'll just parrot that back to you, which basically they sort of blamed it on the pressure from the United States to get Russia to really invest in the ISS. And because Mir was take, you know, taking more and more money to maintain as it aged, they just wanted it decommissioned. They wanted, um, they wanted the focus to be on the ISS. And so, you know, the, that combined with the fact that you know, the State Department sees everything that's put into space as basically a, a weapon. You know, they treat it like that in terms of like uh, licensing. Um, I think that seems to have killed it. And yet, would, space, would SpaceX be possible without that having happened? I don't know. What, what's your take on that, since you have much more background than I do? Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, I, I've heard the same things you just said on, from the same sources. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate to uh, pretend to lend credibility where it, it's just uh, <laughs> right. just kind yeah. of uh, 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 kind of repeating this uh, thing. But I mean, I would say my understanding also about uh, Dennis Tito going up there, I understand he was a big part of MiraCorp as well. Um, he was the first like private space tourist that went up on the Soyuz. My understanding is NASA really objected to that as well. And were like, the Russians were like, we could do anything with our part of the space station. And, and the Americans were like, well, you can't come in our part, you know, that type <laughs> of thing. Right. Okay. And then I understand there was an astronaut that got married while he was in space. Really? Yeah. Cool. And uh, it was like through a virtual conference. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, NASA was really not supportive of those efforts too, and it just seems like um, NASA has really made a, a big shift in terms of being more supportive of the private sector. I mean, it really felt more kind of state-driven as opposed to private sector-driven. Yes, which... but there's no question about who's in charge in those relationships, right? Like I, you know, if for example, if if somebody gets married on the mirror, precisely why is that NASA's business to begin with, right? Well, they were on the International Space Station, and it was yeah. a NASA. Oh, I see. Oh, it was sorry. a NASA astronaut. The... <laughs> yeah, it was a NASA okay. astronaut. Yeah, so, yeah. so is it because that they would rather everything be very serious, sciencey kind of? They don't want it to be cheapened or commercialized. Uh, I'm not sure what the motivation was then, but I, I could tell you, you know, last year uh, there was an act that was passed or a policy that came out from NASA that really opened up commercialization. I mean, you could rent, you, you could send your private astronauts to the International Space Station, pay so much per day. Okay. Uh, you could rent space, um, yeah. uh, you know, that, uh, so, I mean, like even like Doubletree did like a, um, Kind of a promotional thing where they had uh, nano racks put together a oven uh, to bake cookies on orbit oh, yeah. like the first Me. in orbit of being so we're well past that i mean if it was happening today it would be a big deal so i mean right. nasa has really yeah. grown yeah. a lot and you know spacex and blue origin and and virgin galactic i'm sure have really been working to kind of promote that capability yeah so the premise of this uh, of this landing would be that it's a stepping stone to Mars. Is that right? Well, like anything the government does, there's uh, lots of competing interests and viewpoints and, and what have you. So the official administration viewpoint uh, is that we are going back to the moon um, to develop the resources on the moon and to um, use as a test bed for going to, to Mars, but they, 
not limiting the moon activities to just the bare necessities needed to go to Mars, that the moon is worth developing in its own right and exploring and what have you. Then there are definitely those uh, representatives in the house who are like, you know, they just really want to be the first ones to go to Mars. And they're like, everything should be directed towards that. And whatever we do on the moon needs to be the bare minimum. Uh, and, you know, the moment we feel safe enough to go to Mars, we should go there. Okay. And, um, you know, and there's just uh, a wide variety of, of thoughts on it. But you, you talked about um, needing to come up with, the, like, develop the reasons for uh, going to the moon. And I, I was wondering, um, what, what reasons would you see as being worth it? Like, kind of, what would motivate well, I guess I just, I just don't know who, like, the Jerry O'Neill of our time is right? Who's actually articulating a future in which our sort of existence in space is important? Um, because people sort of toss around, oh, because it's climate change or whatever, but it doesn't hold up to any degree of scrutiny. And so um, I just would like to see, I think perhaps it's because science fiction is is not particularly thriving at the moment because the present is so bizarre to begin with. And so um, I, and I think uh, Bruce Sterling sort of said that there's a, it's kind of the end of science fiction at the moment. Um, so I don't know, but I, we still need our imaginations to carry us into uh, other ways of being. And I just, I mean, maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. I know that there's this whole sort of space frontier movement that's, that's very much alive there's you know there are a lot of space enthusiasts it's kind of an interesting community it's, it's, it's an odd bunch <laughs> there's, there's some strange people in it but um yeah i'd like i i just i just think that we need to actually put our attention for a sustained amount of time into what exactly is the benefit of the sort of you know, monkeys in a can type approach instead of, uh, you know, sending more probes or what have you. Yeah. Or, or in, instead of, let's say, sending an AI conversation out into space as well. Like, you know, we've got these one-way broadcasts and we can't, uh, we can't have a conversation back and forth because of the, the distances, but we could send, you know, if we had a viable conversation bot, we could send a simulation of having a conversation with a human, which might be quite fun. Oh, exactly. Like, uh, what are you seeing now? Lots of red stuff. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, you know, I mean, that's an interesting point. I mean, so uh, several things. One is um, the benefits of singing people versus probes. I mean, it's, it's really kind of a, a difficult question, isn't it? Because, um, I mean, probes are relatively cheap. Uh, I mean, you don't have to send oxygen with them or worry about over radiating them in the same sense you do people. Uh, probes can go to sleep for long periods of time and they get there, they wake up and everything's fine and you lose probes and sure there's herrings and stuff, but you don't have, you know, national states of mourning. That's uh, right. You can get or, much more adventurous because you're not killing anyone if you if you take a leap too far. And so, you know, what's the the point of uh, sending a human that might, uh, you know, develop cancer and who is going to have uh, get tired and uh, who has to be uh, protected and and won't actually be able to sense the environment with his senses, right? I mean, That's wasn't. Right was an astronaut really sensing other than visually uh, at all, you know, it's, I guess you got the smell maybe whenever they go back into the, the cabin and, and stuff. But, um, but on the other hand, you know, I was like thinking back to your, your uh, uh, point of all was um, I've taken pictures of like really tall buildings and like really tall mountains and really deep valleys. And, you know, when I was there, 
I was like, whoa, this is a really tall building, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but then, then you go and show it to people and they're yeah. like, oh, okay. You know, it's just, it's just right. like, yeah. you know, you don't, it, that it doesn't have like the same impact. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the question is how it's, is that valuable enough for everything else? You know, I mean, like. So that's an important aspect of it too, because, you know, every, you know, when you go to the Grand Canyon, you quite reliably people feel awe um, and then they they may even feel quite changed at the time they may think that this was this is going to kind of change things for them and then they go right back to their daily lives and nothing happens and i think it's because it's not really ritualized in the way that other things are so for those astronauts that went up and experienced that sort of feeling of connectedness and that uh, those sort of epiphanies about um, uh, about the world's complex and vulnerable ecosystems and and the atmosphere. They came back with quite changed lives because everyone knew that they had done that. Everyone knew that there was like this this rite of passage that they had gone through, and they were a wiser person, and they had they had a different role coming home anyway as ex astronauts, and so. I think we need to look at the all experiences like that are only as valuable as the cultural import that we put on them. So it used to be that you would, when you came of age, you would go on like a vision quest, right? In some of the cultures and you would go out into the wilderness and you would fast and you would have visions and there would be awe involved. And then you would come back and you would suddenly be an elder or a leader in your in your uh, community because you had had that experience and it fed your new role it, it like sort of broke down the barriers for you to become a kind of a new person but you can only do that when there's social cooperation with it i don't know whether this is really answering your question or not it just sort of got me on a tangent Oh, it may not be answering the question, but it, it's definitely stimulating a whole new series of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, because if you look at our culture, the only thing that seems to have widespread cultural significance is uh, money. Um, right. You know, I mean, I've had so many conversations with family, friends, and, and other people about doing various things. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's it's the end question is, you know, who's going to pay for it? Could you make money doing it? Uh, you know, what's the value of it? Or if you are doing things uh, like these interview series, I mean, I've had conversations with family, friends, and whoever, like, oh, you can make some money with that. And I'm like, that would ruin it. I can't right. do that. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, no, it completely twist. I mean, that sort of the market incentives just warp people's behavior in a way that needs to be i mean it cannot be fully avoided because you have to provide something that other people think is of, of value sufficient value but it shouldn't be your whole life it shouldn't be all that you do so i'm glad that you're guarding against that oh absolutely but um i mean essentially i I think the key question is to ask, is something worth doing? And then the money is is how you figure out how to do it, right? I mean, right. It, it you shouldn't, I mean, it, it's sort of like, um, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, you're, you're using a horse to get places, you know, not just to follow behind a horse, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that type of, type yeah. of thing. So, um, so that's that's kind of uh, a difficulty, and I, the, the problem is, it seems like the way that power is accumulated with inside of our society, and the way that power continues to manipulate uh, the members of the society and, and shape them, I mean, it's almost like what you see in academia, for example, um, you have some well um, accepted ideas, and anybody who doesn't necessarily support those well accepted ideas may not be accepted by the institutions. And, right. and so essentially if they become kind of um, homogenous in to some degree, you know, I mean, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's really, especially now, like, not that I could really get into it, but like in the social sciences, there's a real problem at the moment with the sort of dogmatic views and so on. And I, 
I don't know exactly how you fix it, but um, it it's it's stifling our ability to sort of generate these new ideas that you can then winnow down depending on how defensible they are. Yeah, I mean, especially if you're dealing with uh, social sciences, and yeah. and I mean, it, it's really hard to develop objective tests that you can use to argue against people's point of view, right? Yeah. I mean, essentially, it's all through a lens of people's point of view. And it, it's kind of like a house of cards in some way, and everybody's trying to protect it. Yeah. You know, uh, it seems like to me, at least. But I think you're right. Yeah. But with the, the money thing, I mean, it's completely the same type of thing. I mean, um, it, you know, what career should you have? Well, the one that you earn the most money with and, uh, you know, which house should you get? Well, the one that you could resell for the highest value, you know, I mean, it's like all these things and really you should have the career that's most fulfilling where you can contribute right. the most and you should have the house that you really enjoy living in, not the yeah. one that, you know, but. I think it's true. And I think I do see, I mean, I'm in my forties now. And so I look around at the different paths that my friends took. And I think the ones who chose money over fulfillment in their in their careers, they they spend a lot of that money on kind of um, palliative stuff, you know, to make them feel better about the day that they just had at their at the work that doesn't doesn't speak to them. And uh, I don't want to live in that sort of yo-yo sort of um, environment. Um, then again, it is nice not to be poor. Right, so you have to find a sort of a medium state where, uh, where you know you've found something that feeds you as well. And then, like you're talking about the corrupting influence of money as well. Uh, how many people have taken a hobby and tried to turn it into a job only to hate what they loved? Right. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, it's, uh, <laughs> there's no easy answers, are there? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all just. Well, just part of it. I mean, it's so, yeah, it's very, it's complex if you try to take it all in, right? You know, coronavirus, for example, I, I find it difficult to think about in a, in a global context, the, you know, the, all the economic ramifications and all the social changes and the, you know, the changes to education, and where is it all going and how do you map it out? And I, the fact is that my brain can't model it. And so, you just have to look at the personal, right? You have to look at, okay, you know, my son's wearing a mask to school in September and that's all I need to know right now, right? Like, um, so yeah. Um, and I, I know this is uh, just like at the top of the hour. Um, do you have uh, some more time or did you have to go? Sure, yeah. Do you, um, be, however you like, you know, the next 20 minutes or so, sound good? Oh uh, yeah, that, that'd be yeah. perfect. Um, cool. Well, I guess, first of all, um, how did you find out that we were going to the moon in 2024 or, or had you just heard about it? So that specific date, I think, I think you are the one <laughs> that, I mean, that's like the first time it really stuck. So I went to a conference, a Humans to Mars conference in Washington, D.C., I want to say five years ago? Yeah, I like think 2016 that. was probably the year. Okay, well done. And then, and so the administrator of NASA was there and he was talking about this stage approach, which is what I had referred to there where, okay, first we're going to the moon and then we're going to some sort of, well, maybe there was a near, no, there's some sort of Lagrangian point out in, I don't know. And then, you know, beyond that outpost, the third thing is the moon. And I think he attached some dates to that, but I wouldn't be surprised if those dates had drifted since then. Um, and that was sort of the first time that I really understood that NASA was in the, the Mars game for real, because before that it had been these outliers and, um, and also a lot of groups that nobody took very seriously and probably still don't. So it's, it's interesting to see the political will building through other people just saying, well, we'll just do it ourselves. And then sort of NASA creeps in that direction uh, slowly, you know, like the juggernaut that it is. 
Yeah, I, I've heard some uh, biologists or ecologists talk about how life creates a capacity to support more life. Like, uh, I mean, you have like the, the bacteria and the fungus come in and then you have the plants and then you have like the insects and then you have like the small mammals and the, the what have you. And, and before long, you have a fully developed ecosystem, right? Right, yeah. And the same thing is true in these industries as well. Whenever you have sort of like this, uh, you know, only one tree and there's like nothing else around, there's not much of an ecosystem, you know. Yeah. Uh, and But once you get something going with like your SpaceX and your Blue Origin, I mean, how familiar are you with uh, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos's company? Oh, I know almost nothing about it. I think there was, was it, was it Blue Origin or was it the Virgin one that had a crash a few years ago? That was uh, Virgin Galactic. Yeah, with the two okay. pilots, uh, one survived, one died. Okay, um, yeah. I remember I was in a coffee shop reading that headline and I gasped like audibly. <laughs> and everyone around me was like, what is she? Anyway, um, no, I don't know. Just tell me about them. <laughs> but would you believe they're actually slightly older by a matter of, I think, half a year than SpaceX, uh, but okay. they've been uh, very, very quiet about uh, what they've been doing, but they have a very unique funding model. Jeff Bezos sells a billion dollars a year of his Amazon stock to pay for the company. Okay. So uh, that kind of okay. opens up, um, uh, you know, options that isn't available to uh, normal companies, I guess. Well, isn't that interesting because Amazon is something that we all use and it's almost as if effectively it's our tax dollars, but from a, it's like our corporate tax dollars at work, right? Yeah. And you have a choice to, and you have a choice to buy Amazon or not. So you could. Well, do you? Do you? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard to live without it. <laughs> it is. It is. But uh, you know, that's just, is that, I mean, the thing is, uh, since the invention of the car, it's been really hard to sell horses, you know, <laughs> just like <it. laughs> exactly. yeah. you had to come up with a better car and uh, they're constantly pushing themselves to do better. I mean, sometimes I order stuff and before you even click the order button, it arrives at the door. I'm like, yeah, it's, incredible. You know? it's incredible. Like, yeah, the prime stuff, like it just, um, it's ridiculous because I can't even imagine in my head the series of events that would have added up to that, you know, 12 hours between when I clicked, you know, and remembering that I'm in Canada as well, right? So anyway, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I know, whenever you think about, and you know, they had that video about the whole Amazon drone delivery. Um, it was a few years yeah. back where Amazon was showing a kind of a conceptual thing where they had put, created a drone to do like uh, deliveries. And are they doing that now for real or no? I had not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, yeah, at least uh, definitely not in the U.S. Uh, for right. sure. But there's certainly like so I go to TED every year, and this year was virtual. But there was somebody talking about um, he's got a delivery company that has little sort of autonomous uh, sidewalk carts running oh, around yes. delivering stuff. Um, and that seemed like a kind of a neat idea, although of course you know the jobs that get you know uh, uh, cut out from that I'm not sure but anyway yeah I mean that's kind of an interesting uh, thing I mean that's sort of like a big gap in our educational system is that we are still educating people as if they're going to become assembly line workers <laughs> yeah. whenever a, that job is going away for everybody, you know, yeah. like, and if they're not going to be assembly line workers, then what are they going to be? And, you know, it's yeah. like, uh, it's like our education system uh, has a big challenge. Like, uh, That's right. I mean, so certainly our education system, well, and the American public one has not reached the full potential, but there is a theoretical maximum where, you know, some people just, just intrinsically are like their aptitude is, is for moving their bodies, doing things physically, right? Like um, being physically skilled. And so if we replace them with robots, they're not going to become programmers. Yeah, I, that's that's true. Um, but then there's other people who have the potential for amazing aptitudes that 
kind of like the educational system hammers it out of them. You know? Yes, that's true. Yeah, that takes the curiosity away completely. And I, I have no data to support it, but I would almost argue that there's more people that get it hammered out of them than are limited to it. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, um, yeah, we're like, so in my life, we're, we're embarking on a Montessori journey, like a Montessori high school journey coming up next year, which is kind of an interesting, because I didn't have the greatest experience at school. And so um, we're going to experiment with that. There's a, there's a, a school that has like this amazing cooking program and they uh, and they let the kids plan their own school trip and it's all very uh, autonomous. So we're hoping that that works out. That sounds awesome. This is for your son or daughter? For my son, yeah. For your son. Yeah. I'd love to hear how that, um, I have to <laughs> get touch base with you a year from now and see well, what you're- Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, feel free, absolutely. Um, my oldest son, uh, he went to a private school in New Hampshire, and yeah. um, this school was kind of unique in the sense that every class was limited to 12 people, Perfect. and every class was a discussion. Like, they would sit around the table with the professor, and they were expected to have been prepared, and they have to move along the discussion about the, the material. So valuable. Yeah. yeah. Compared with, like, what workbooks, right? That's what all the other kids are doing. Yeah, I know. It's like uh, uh, it's, it's synonymous to like the, the mother bird coming with like the little worm and all the chirps are like, feed me. You, know? <laughs> like, you open up the head and pour in the knowledge and job's yeah. done, but that doesn't work that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's a very, it's a much more social experience learning than, than we are really willing to admit, I guess. And it really is that, you know, you can only really learn from people whom you admire and respect, for example. Um, and, you know, we don't really take that into account when we, when we hire and fire. Um, so it's that sort of thing. Yeah. Have I, I mean, before we get onto all kinds of different topics, like have I, you know, addressed your central mission here for this podcast, for this, do you call it a podcast? Um, I just call it an interview. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, I did have two other questions I usually ask, and, and that is, uh, one is, um, what do you think about us going back to the, the moon? You, you touched on it that, you know, you, it, you, you were kind of excited about it, but you're not really sure about the why. I was wondering if maybe you could go a little bit more into that. I mean, so you said it yourself about the sort of American nature of things and, it, and it's, you know, it's not surprising that it's American led because that was that historically has been and uh, continues to be a, a center of the, the resources. But I, you know, as somebody who's committed to the peaceful use of space and really exploration for, um, for the joy of discovery, um, I, I would like to see even more collaboration and participation with, with nations that have, have no history of having participated, you know, and, um, you know, uh, so that astronauts don't have to naturalize when they move to the States in order to be in contention, let's say, things like that. Um, I, I mean, it's, it is hard for me, you know, if, if I had the answers, then I would, the, the problem wouldn't exist. Do you see what I mean? Why? So I, I can't, I can, there's a limit to how much I can specify what we need to do, because if I really knew, then there wouldn't be such a dearth of what I'm talking about, which is um, elaboration of, um, of the things that we might do in space, simply the things that humans might do in that location and why that would be cool. So um, whether that means listing all of the things that we do on earth and thinking how we might do them in space, 
and some people have done that with the low earth orbit they've you know done dances there and things and and incorporated that as a different creative constraint um, because that can really you know that could all kinds of fields could flourish with those new parameters um, and and we could bring that the fruits of that back down to earth as well architecture everything else um, but but also there should be some things that those creative constraints uh, generate that we don't do on earth at all. And there, those would become new human fields. So, you know, I, I wouldn't get fixated on the sort of homesteading aspect or the setting of cells up, you know, in cities, just like here and so on. That may be missing the point. It may be about, um, really generating things that surprise us um, out of out of the new environment and by definition because it would surprise us i don't know what they would, would be at all I, they would probably come out of left field from just spending time there you know the peaceful use of space uh it, it definitely seems like we sort of gave away our moral authority there with the formation of space force and it's not too late. Just pack it in, please. Just pack it in. <laughs> but, you know, that was in kind of response to the sense that uh, we almost have no choice, right? Because uh, you have like uh, uh, China and uh, Russia and India all testing like anti-satellite weapons and um, what have you. And, and we've come to depend so heavily on uh, satellites for um, you know, communication and, and weather and observation and, and a whole bunch of other things. But I, I'm just like wondering, um, aside from kind of countering force with force, I, I wonder, you know, is there an option where we go, okay, you can kill our satellites, you know, but still, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to accept that as an acceptable thing, you know, and is there like some kind of international pressure or argument that could have been waged instead. Yes, to... it's called diplomacy. And unfortunately, the States has sort of given up on it. But it, I believe in it. Absolutely. You can talk to people. That's how you solve problems like like grown adults. You know, you can talk, you can talk to the Taliban, you can call them up on the phone, they answer, right? You can, you know, actually discuss and come to terms with other human beings and uh you know not walk around with clubs like cavemen um that's my philosophy and and just because the russians or the chinese are hopping around looking for attention i don't think that's any reason uh to be building up an arsenal or preparing for war um i mean you can probably tell i get quite emotional about this stuff but i'm just so fed up with it because i don't want it to be our children's world i think it's such a waste and we've just got to focus on on the positive and and growing a future that is uh, constructive, not destructive. I'm just wondering how much uh, like Star Trek sort of opened the door to creating, uh, you know, the space force in the sense that Star Trek, the Federation is always seen as being a very positive thing. It was sure it had weapons and it was military, but you know, it's some, I, I'm just wondering if that kind of like in the back of people's minds thinking, oh yeah, it should be okay. You know, I mean. That's interesting because it's, I suppose that was built on the sort of the nautical model of, you know, exploration by, so yeah, militarization of the seas, right? And was, was something that was sort of linked with um, exploration. And so, how do you organize a large group of people with me? That actually, they just thought, well, if people are going to be aligned in a mission, then they must be some sort of force, right? Um, and actually, you can be aligned in a mission um, simply through sharing values and through shared identity and it doesn't have to take away your um your your plurality or your um or your 
sense that others can join of your inclusivity? Yeah, we definitely have trouble. Uh, I mean, it seems like a widespread threat uh, to individual people's identity and place in the world whenever other people have alternative views. I mean, you can see that all across the spectrum, pretty much every place. And uh, you're, you're definitely right. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be different. Well, you're right in the heart of Texas right now. So I, I, I can only imagine. I mean, you must uh, encounter all kinds of ideas that I barely have exposure to. Oh, even with my own family. I get really? front row seats uh, with uh, <laughs> <laughs> all sorts of ideas. And <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. How are you doing with the coronavirus in, in the, your part of the world? Oh, we're doing okay. Um, you know, my wife and I, we both work at home. My children, uh, their school have been moved online. Um, my in-laws are with me. They're like 70 years old. Okay. Um, so, you know, in the high risk category. Yeah. And so from our standpoint, like the, the, the cost of staying self-contained, like there's no economic cost to it. Yeah. That's uh, but right. the risk of kind of opening up from their, you know, to their health is, is quite large. So we're, yeah. we're kind of, um, on the extreme side of things, uh, in terms of mask wearing and, and social distancing and avoiding indoor places and, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, it's difficult to calculate because it's one of those sort of small chance of completely catastrophic outcome type things. But as you say, to, for you, the cost is, is minimal for, for that. I mean, I'm sure your kids would rather be with their friends, but other than that, I mean, they should be the first ones in line to, to, to see new people anyway. Yeah, and I mean, I think the mortality rate is coming out to be a little less than half a percent uh, okay. for this disease, you know, based upon what we've seen in terms of what have you. But whenever you like look at my son's high school, he has like 4,000 people there. You're like, half a percent, that means uh, yeah. students would die. You know, it's just like, uh, uh, I mean, and that doesn't include like teachers and family and, you know, associated uh, siblings and what have yeah. you. You're like, hmm. That would, that would be bad. But how is it there? So uh, I think we thought that we more or less licked it, and now it's um, creeping back, but, uh, but not in the numbers that we see in the States. So, for example, our daily numbers in Ottawa, are, which is a, a city of a million people, are sort of between 15 and 25 at the moment, our daily cases. Um, Any idea on how many people get tested each day? Oh, I could look it up for you right now. Um, let's see. I always feel like that's uh, an important consideration. I mean, because if you test yeah. for 15 to 20 a day and you got 15 to 20 a day, that is a, a really difficult situation. But if you test a thousand a day, you have 15 to 20, they're like, oh, okay, we might be doing okay. Yeah. Today. So we currently have four people in the ICU um and 11 hospitalized there's been no deaths yesterday but a current like a total of 264 deaths oh where do they say testing we've got like our little dashboard <laughs> that we can look at every day okay i may not find it in time to be relevant to this discussion uh certainly i mean the testing stations actually the result times are one of the most crucial things because people seem to not actually isolate until or not be able to isolate until they know one way or another and so the benefit of the testing is reduced right yeah absolutely um well the the last question i usually ask people is if it was uh, safe and affordable would you have an interest in going to space yourself um, so this, the safe part, I suppose, is important. The affordable part is important. Um, for me, they would have to also solve um, travel sickness, like motion sickness, because it sounds pretty miserable <laughs> in that. Like, I don't really want to be barfing the whole time. Uh, 
I think there's going to be physical discomfort because it's just not, it's the frontier, right? It's not like no frontier is ever physically comfortable. Um, but if there was something for me to do there, it's the same thing with traveling. I'm not really a tourist, but I love to like actually uh, transplant myself into a new place if I have a role to play in that community. So if I, if I were to follow the work into space, if I were to have something that people were relying on me to accomplish in space, certainly I would, absolutely. Okay, but not like a, a vacation type of thing, like a, a week in orbit or two weeks. I, it doesn't back. sound all that restful to me, so <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <You're> like, <laughs> and how about you, would you go? I think I would. I think I would go to orbit, uh, to the moon. I don't think I would go to Mars um, because that would just be too long. I keep telling people I want to retire on the moon, you know, have like a little oh, house, yeah. continuous picture of the uh, the earth and what have you, but it'd have to be a pretty, <laughs> pretty nice setup, you know? Right, yeah. But never know. Yeah, indeed. All kinds of things could happen. I mean, if you think back to 10 years ago, how, how much your life has expanded in terms of your world, your viewpoints and so on. I mean, you just have to extrapolate to know that you could well be reporting to me from the moon in 20 years, right? Oh, exactly. There, there would be a little, uh, you know, a couple of second delay. With our, True, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I think we can manage. <laughs> yeah, unless they've, you know, uh, unless they've sorted out that whole light speed thing <laughs> in between. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I know we're right at uh, time. Uh, is there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to cover? I don't think so. This has been a lovely surprise. I had no idea what to expect. So thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate you um, uh, helping me with my project. And if you know anybody else, I got over 1,600 more days to go. So. Wow. Okay. Well, my friend Brianna will be on in a couple days. And uh, Brianna Brownell. Okay. Um, and she's my creative partner. We're making a show right now about artificial intelligence. She'll be, she'll be incredible. So. Um, uh, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> I'm sure she can send you the sizzle reel <laughs> that we just put together. Okay. Well, I'll let you go then. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.